Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Phoenix Space Town Hall. We're so glad that uh, you've joined us today. I'm Josh Black. I'm APFA National Secretary, and I'll be moderating the session today. With me, I have Todd Smitala, who is one of our communications representatives. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Deb and Robin to uh, kick us off. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our second um, Phoenix-based Town Hall under your newly Phoenix leadership of Socorro Flowers and myself, as well as our BCRs. Um, today we've got um, Deborah Volpe will be on with us, as well as Socorro and Ankit Patel. And Deb and um, Ankit are running the contract action team. team. So um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves and then we'll come back to me. So go ahead, Deb. Hi, I'm Deborah Volpe, and I'm now Philly based. I was in Phoenix for many years. Um, going to be starting my 35th year coming up in the next week or so, and working on the contract auction team with Ankit Patel. Ankit. Hello, everyone. Um, Ankit Patel uh, started in Phoenix and then to LA, and now based in DFW. Uh, I'm on my eighth year as a flight attendant. Um, just excited to work with all of you on the contract uh, action team and get the membership informed and engaged about this negotiations. And next, um, Sakura Flowers, our Phoenix based vice president. Oops. Hello, everyone. I'm Sakura Flowers, Phoenix based flight attendant. I can't believe I'm about to start my 29th year. Okay, um, I'd like to take care of a few little items before we get into this and some of the questions which um, Josh will be moderating. But um, I just would like to remind everyone that we now have an attendance FSM here in Phoenix and it's Elaine Reynolds. Um, instead of calling your, your FSM that handles everything else, anything to do with attendance, you're gonna call Elaine. And I just wanna give everyone Elaine's number and we will put it out on our base brief. But her phone number that you can reach her at is 480. 693-2917. That's 480-693-2917. And of course, her, her email address would be elaine.reynolds at aa.com. And one other little housekeeping item. We've had some problems again with um, line holders not um, notifying crew tracking or crew scheduling that they're not taking their scheduled deadhead. Um, once you know that you're not going to take your deadhead and you've got that seat, you don't have to ask permission of your line holder. You just have to tell them you're not going to take that um, scheduled deadhead. This will help scheduling know who they can reassign to something happen. Plus, it'll keep you from getting a missed trip if they try to give it to you because you didn't follow 16H in the contract. OK, back over to you, Josh, for our questions. Thank you for that information, Robin. Um, okay, so we have a few questions that were submitted in advance. As a reminder to everyone who joined today, um, you're able to submit questions during the session from your phone. There's a little chat bubble at the top and you just click on that and you can uh, submit questions to us. So the first question that uh, we'll go through has to do with um, five day, five leg day trips and what's the use? Um, basically uh, requesting information about why we have them and how exhausting that that those types of trips can be. Um, Robin, I think you're going to take that one. Yes, um, good question. We did address this with the company, the um, union as a whole, because it wasn't just Phoenix with these five leg trips. And after meeting with the company, they were concerned about everything that went on in August with the with the operation falling apart and they agreed no more five leg trips for us. And if you look at October, there are no five leg trips. So that was addressed and I don't think we'll see any five leg trips going forward. They realized that it was causing our days to be way too long and the, which would lead to us timing out and another disruption to the operation. So I don't think you'll see any more five leg days going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Uh, the next one, next question has to do with uh, Phoenix base numbers and headcount um, in the future, especially with the return of the EVLOAs. 
Um, they say approximately 150 leaves returning November, December. And, uh, and has AA given any info and projections for the Phoenix space size and flying for the future? Robin. Um, we did talk with our regional director and our acting base manager. So Socorro and I met with him last week and we brought it up that um, in 2019, when we met with Doug Parker, the Doug said the numbers that he was given was that we would um, need to lose 700 from the total amount of flight attendants available as of February 2019, which was 22, I believe 49, which would have taken us down to about 1500 or a little under 1500 flight attendants. Right now we're looking at approximately with the EVL waste coming back close to 1100 flight attendants. We don't have an accurate number yet because until the days actually come, there may be other people that decide not to come back to work. So once we have those numbers, we will let you know. Um, Debbie Carvada has given us, um, has promised us that she was going to take this to planning and find out exactly what our true numbers should be because Doug was very adamant at the time that we would not go under that number that he was given us because that was what planning said was the optimum size of Phoenix with the type of flying that we're doing. Now we know COVID hit and that kind of, you know, disrupted everything. But now that we're ramping up flying again, we want to know what size Phoenix is going to be. If, if they're saying we're going to go back to what we were like prior to the COVID hitting, you know, back to 2019, then we definitely feel that 1500 would be the size that planning had originally said for Phoenix. So we're just waiting to hear the numbers that they're planning to give us. Thank you. Thank you, Robin, for that answer. Um, the next two questions we have revolve around uh, negotiations. Um, we are in active negotiations with the company right now, and in fact, the team is with uh, is over at the company right uh, today. So, with these two questions, they are um, suggestions uh, for what could potentially go into our contract going forward. I think Deb and Ankit are going to um, provide you with the with the appropriate forum to provide those suggestions and also give some information about the uh, contract action campaign that we have. Yep. Okay, yes, yeah, so um, I would like for you to read the questions because I know when people submit them, oh, sure. we do wanna hear them. Absolutely, the first question uh, is, I would like to see us uh, exchange flight time for duty time. That's the first one. Okay. And then the next one. The second one is how is our reserve system going to be fixed so that it is system wide seniority based? OK, so the way to answer those questions is for us not to answer those questions as much as we would like to sort of chime in and give our opinion. The proper form truly is to email the negotiating committee at negotiators.apfa.org at APFA.org, negotiators at APFA.org. And the reason why is because if we give our opinion, and, and Anka and I are not on the negotiating committee, but we are part of the negotiation structure with the team. If we give our opinion, then that sort of takes away from what they're doing in the bargaining room. So the negotiating committee is doing exactly what they're supposed to do. They're researching, they're vetting, and they are creating their proposals. They are looking at their email. They are taking these uh, suggestions and um, and this input very, very seriously. So again, I'm going to say it again. If you have suggestions and comments regarding what is actually being negotiated and what you want to see, it's going to be negotiators at APFA.org. And I do know there's going to be a survey that should be coming out soon. Um, with Robin's permission, Ankit and I are going to dive into a little bit what the contract action team is. And um, I'm going to take a little bit of time here, just a bit. So this upcoming negotiations that we're in right now, we know we have a blended workforce, and we also know we have people who are very, very senior, people who are mid-range seniority, and people who are what's called, they, people say new hires, we like to say the new generation. And the new generation is flight attendants who are hired around the merger or after the merger. People in mid seniority range, they're not ready to retire. They're just looking for a better contract as a next stepping stone. And for those that are probably getting ready to retire, this will most likely be their last agreement. 
So this is going to be a little bit different than what we have seen in the past. So for anyone that's been through the Section 6 negotiations process, whether on Legacy US or Legacy AA, normally you get minimal information from your negotiating team. You'll hear, we negotiated this week, we've talked about a few sections, but you don't get much more than that. And normally there's a call to action, usually when there's either a strike vote or when it's time to vote on a tentative agreement. And then you're given a tentative agreement and you're given the small <laughs> window of time in which to really decide what you want. Okay, erase all that. We're not doing that with the set of negotiations. We, the membership, 26,000 plus, we're actually going to be a part of this whole thing. Now, the negotiating committee can't actually take us physically into the, into the bargaining room, but they can take what's called our actions into the bargaining room. This is a, this is a, um, a way of engaging the membership through small, medium, and large activities. You're going to see when we put stuff out, we have the word action in capital letters for a reason. Some of the activities are going to be very small, like we just saw the email campaign that launched that's still out in the field right now. And we're asking flight attendants to send that letter to David Seymour. And it talks about we need our hotels that are uh, that should be booked, especially when we have irregular operations. Too many times crews are left on hold with tracking. That's one of our first activities. You're going to see activities and actions that are bigger. That are maybe a full base activity or regional or system wide or better yet. Maybe we're linking arms with other unions at American Airlines and at other carriers to do things together. The membership is needed, is critical for our negotiating committee to get the agreement that we want. Because if our actions speak loud, and they will, then our actions are going to actually help persuade management to come a little bit more to the middle instead of being stubborn on issues. So it's going to be everybody. And the best way to get involved is to sign up as an activist. And you're probably rolling your eyes thinking, OK, what does that mean? you got to commit to reading the hotlines. And when you hear wrong information, directing someone to the hotline. The other thing is, is that when there's actions and activities out there, whether it's a leaflet or picketing or anything else that we're going to be doing and some creative things that you either attend and if you can't attend, you tell people to attend and tell them how to get the information. So we're going to be building momentum. We're not asking people to start on the 20th step of a 20 step staircase. We're going to bring everybody up gradually and then the membership is going to completely engage. Now, for those that think that we shouldn't be saying this out loud because we're giving management our playbook. Yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. We are telling them exactly how we are coming at them. There is no secrets. This is going to be completely transparent. All actions and activities that we design will be legal. OK, so I want to make that clear. No one's going to be going off doing their own thing. Um, there's also going to be a digital campaign, and I'm going to hand this off to Ankit so I could talk about the digital campaign, and he's also going to tell you how to sign up as an activist. Ankit. Thank you, Deb. Um, so part of the digital effort will be to create more content that's um, aiming at all levels of uh, learning abilities in a way. So we'll be coming out with more educational uh, videos, graphics, um, also helping uh, drive all the information to uh, base pages on Facebook. So you know where and uh, from whom to get the correct information regarding negotiations. Another thing is, uh, you know, uh, last year we all learned how to utilize the QR codes, so we'll be heavily relied, relying upon the QR codes um, to spread our information and, and be more informed and engage about it. And if you have any feedback, feel free to reach out to us at uh, action at APFA.org. And if you have any questions for negotiator, it's actually negotiate at APFA.org is the email to get give and get feedback from the negotiator is it is negotiate at APFA.org and we're excited for this campaign and we're looking forward to working with everyone. We're hoping all 24,000 plus flight attendants are involved with this process and more engaged and if you guys have any questions, concerns, feel free to reach out to us. 
at action uh, at APFA.org. Thanks, Akit. Um, and my apologies for uh, getting that email address uh, wrong. So it is negotiated at APFA.org. Also, in each base, we have um, members that are called part of the core group of the contract action team. And Phoenix has three point people that you could also reach out to if for some reason you don't want to reach out to us or you want to know who the people are in your base. And in the Phoenix base, we have Odette Miranda, Ralph Huerta, and Del Freilich. So feel free to reach out to them either at their email address if, or you can reach out to us at action uh, at APFA.org. Feel free to shoot us any questions uh, or concerns and we will get back with you. Robin? Okay, um, I appreciate it. Thanks so much, De Deborah and Ankit, for your time and for explaining all this. If anyone has any questions, feel free to send them in. And I believe Deborah and Ankit are going to stay around till the end of this. And I will. He's okay. got. He, he has a call that he's okay. going to be getting on. But uh, Deborah will be here to take questions uh, if anybody has any for about the contract action team. Um, I'd also like to be able to address something that the company has asked me to. Um, get out to everybody. There's a lot of questions about when will the sick points be going off your line? They are working on it and it will be in October. We're not sure of an exact date in October, but it will be in October. But if you have any of those sick days or points from March of 2020 to August 14th of 2021, they are going to be removed. And any good points that you lost will be put back in your little good point bank. But please just as soon as they know, they will let us know. I know they're working on a program right now, but they asked us. They're getting inundated with these calls and it's the same thing. So if you can get that out to everybody that it will be done in October, we will also put it in our base brief. Um, um, is Sakura, is there anything that you'd like to add? No, I, I don't think of anything right now. Okay. Um, if, any, if there's any questions, we'd certainly like to hear them. I know that we've had a few other um, instances also where we're also um, being questioned about our sick calls. Um, once again, they're saying that Phoenix has some of the highest sick calls in the system. Um, Socor and I are working on reports that show that, yes, our reserve sick calls have been high, but they're not any higher than three or four of the other bases. Um, we will present that to the company. However, you know, we do want you to realize that um, we're getting ready to, in March, go back to our um, London flying, hopefully, if not before then, if everything turns out wait. We want to know, let the company know that we're ready for it and we have the manpower for it and that our sick calls are, are this, this is only because of still the, the virus and um, the new vaccinations and not the um, anywhere that we believe that if we continue to call out sick, they'll send more people to Phoenix because that's not the case. So I would just, we just wanted to address that in this also. Um, I know that uh, people have been concerned about how our flying is going to be. I know that we did not get a lot of, um, our flying did go up in October and we did not get a lot of um, vacation low. I believe we only got 38 um, people that got vacation low. And um, their, um, our line average was 80.5 four or something, correct, Scora? You're still muted. Sorry. Yeah, I believe you're correct. I don't have the summary right in front of me, but I can pull that up. Trying to work off of two different screens. Yeah, the line average actual was 80.54. We ended up with 672 line holders, 170 reserves. 
38, 38 held um, low lines only with vacation. And we did have two constraints. We had a, a required minimum of 70 hours that happened at bid position number one. And then later there was a required minimum line value of 410 at bid position 410. OK, thank you. Um, I don't think we'll see that in November with the with some of our EVLOAs coming back then. But if you have vacation in November, you may be looking at vacation low. We'll try to get some information out to you before then so that you know whether what your um, chances are of holding vacation low in November. Um, I'm going to direct a question at Deborah Volpe right now because I was just wondering if people want to join as an activist, I know that you've given them some information. Um, what type of a commitment would they need to be making to this? It, it's it's really not a big commitment other than staying informed. That's your that's your commitment. So your commitment is accessing the hotline. The first step is to make sure you're signed up for the hotline because that is the initial way you're going to be getting information. In those hotlines, not only are we going to have information, but a lot of cases we may have some videos in there and we'll be launching one, I believe, later this week that we think people will find. Um, it, it's really about the Section 6 process and what to expect in negotiations. So um, the commitment, it's really, really simple. Let's talk about the jump seat wireless. You're sitting on the jump seat chatting with someone. You have information. You say, look, it's in the hotline. Here's what it is. You're on a crew van. You're on a layover. You're in the crew lounge. You're in ops. That's it. You are telling people where the information is. You're telling them, hey, look, there's going to be a leafleting or there's going to be an email campaign or someone has um, is talking about something that's rumor is not accurate. You can tell them, look, that's not true. This was in the hotline and I actually have a copy of it either in my bag or it's downloaded on my device. That is your commitment. That's it. Robin. OK, I wanted to go over a few other things that was in our Phoenix space brief because um, I know that even though it's. Information that we've been going over several times that. Um, some of you have not been able to have not either seen it or um, it's something that you um, might have been too far down in the base brief and you just didn't get to um, get to it. But did you know that should you return to base between 2300 and 0600 due to late operation, that's a delay of your inbound flights, you are entitled to actual transportation charges substantiated by receipts. What does this mean to you? It means that if you're tired and or you've got Princess Parking and you don't want that person to have to come there and pick you up at oh dark 30, like one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, you can get an Uber or a Lyft and get that receipt to the company and they will reimburse you. Um, another thing is what is considered positive contact? We've gone over this time and time again, but it's always bears repeating. Positive contact is just that positive. It's not a one alert. It's not um, a text message. It's not um, a gate agent running down there to tell you something. It's the three people that can contact you. You know, your the pilot in command can give you that ACARS message and FSM or scheduling. Those are the ones that, you know, a member of management, you know, as an FSM, that is your positive contact. Um, and you're not required to have your phone on while you're working. In fact, they frown on us having our phone on as we're working. I mean, they don't want us on the phone when our flight, when our planes are, you know, our passengers are deplaning. So um, I certainly wouldn't be concerned that you're phone is turned off and it's in your bag and they can't get a hold of you. That's that's the nature of the job. You know, um, you certainly don't want to be on that phone when you're saying bye bye to everybody as they're leaving, which we we really should be doing. Um, the other thing that we seem to have a little problem with is 10J4. Um, once a crew originates 
That means they've started that sequence. You can be rescheduled. But if you're a line holder and you come back to base because your sequence is done, they cannot send you back out. Reserves can be sent out if there's nobody else that they can use, but line holders cannot be. Once you've landed in base and your sequence is over, you're that's it, you're done. So um, just some little housekeeping issues that we can talk about there. Um, there's one other thing, it's per 8G1 of the JCBA, a flight attendant will not be required to work during a vacation. We were seeing last month where flight attendants were trying, they were trying to fly flight attendants into their vacation day. They cannot take your vacation away from you, nor can they force you to fly on your vacation. Please keep that in mind. But the most important thing that I can always, that I can tell you is know your contract. I can't say this enough, um, especially going into negotiations as we are. You've got to know what our old contract is so that you can know what we want to see improved in our new contract. And this is your contract. This is what, this is gonna be your Bible for the next so many years. So make sure that it's what you want to see in there. Take what you see in this contract that we've got right now and say, how can I see this improved? What quality of life improvements mean a lot to me, which would get me to come to a yes vote? So it's extremely important that you know your contract, not only so that they it can't be violated or, you know, um, but also so that you know what you want to see in the next contract. So Cora, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Um, what I'd like to maybe mention is going over the how to figure your standby duty limitations when you're sitting in the standby room. And it's really a two step process. First, to figure out what the length of the duty day is, you need to look at the duty day for that trip that you are being assigned. The actual start of your standby time does not come into the equation at this point. So you'd have to go into let me pull up the chart. I don't have it open. Apologies. So you would go to the chart on 11-4. So that's 11E. And let's just say that the trip reports at 730 in the morning and it had and you're going to look and you're going to see that pretty much every um, scheduled duty period because we only have four is there 13 hours and 15 minutes so then you actually start your duty day clock which begins at your standby time which let's just say is 4 a.m so the 4 a.m does not dictate the duty day limitation like if you look at a, a trip that reports at 4 a.m it has a 10 15 duty day limitation that does not apply because the trip reports at 730 and that's what dictates the duty day, but the duty clock for that day starts at your standby time at 4 a.m. So and I do know that I get a lot of um, calls or texts on that. So it's just, and there is an example of that in the standby reserve duty limitations, which is on page 11-5, that's 11G, and it lists out an actual example but that is one question that I, I do get a lot is the duty day limitations for a standby, especially for those that start those early standbys. So hopefully that will help eliminate some questions. Thanks, Sakura. Um, I'd also like to bring to everyone's attention that we get a lot of phone calls regarding IODs, injury on duties, and how workman comp works. And I'm gonna tell you that we direct all those calls to APFA National to our IOD chair and our IOD um, desk, simply because the um, we do have contractual guidelines, but our workman's comp is actually governed by the state laws. So er everything that happens um, as far as it, it, the, the limitations and everything is what is happens, what is, like I said, governed by the state of Arizona. And um, I'm going to be honest with you, we've got enough on our plates that 
Thank goodness we've got somebody like Belia Pexton, who heads up the IOD, is a national IOD chair, and Jenea Bigcraft, who's our Phoenix um, health chair, local chair, that do know everything there is about this so that um, they can answer your questions because they're educated on this. So if you have any questions regarding that, I, I strongly suggest that you call um, APFA National at 817-540-0108, or you can call on our APFA line here and leave a message for Jenea. Um, I'm gonna take this back to um, Deborah. Okay, so believe it or not, I'm getting text messages <laughs> while we're doing this, so people are watching, which is a good thing. Um, the question I got from a fly attendant that I know wants to know if the contract action team will be out there trying to get a yes or a no vote. So let me be very, very clear. You should never, ever, 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 ever hear anybody tell you how to vote, ever. We will we'll never say vote no, we will never say vote yes, we will say vote. We want you to vote. We want you to have an educated vote. And we will tell you how to go about getting your information. If we don't have an answer for you, we'll definitely get back with you. Um, the other thing too, is that by me saying the wrong email address, I got two text messages. So people are paying attention. I like that. It is your questions for negotiations. Go to negotiate at apfa.org. I wanna make that one perfectly clear also. So once again, negotiate at APFA.org. The contract action team is going to be all of us. I want you to imagine that um, if you were sports minded, having that six man coming off the bench or that six woman coming off the bench, we're gonna be that, that extra team member, but for our negotiators to be successful, it's gonna mean all of us being engaged to the best of our ability. So right now we definitely have a email campaign out there. If you look at the uh, hotline that we sent out last week, it is an email to David Seymour regarding crew accommodations and how we should not be waiting for our hotel rooms. We should not be sleeping in airports. We should not be camping out in the lobbies that we need our hotel accommodations taken care of. We need that. We need language in our contract, but we need it. it we need it today and moving forward in the future. Thanks, Deborah. Um, we've, we've been waiting for some questions to come in until then. Um, Josh, has there been any other questions submitted? We did. We got a couple more. Um, first one that we have, uh, why are they having crews from other bases dead heading into Phoenix to fly our trips? It does not make, make sense, especially using up passenger seats or full flights. Well, we totally agree with that, and we've taken them to task every time they've done that. However, when you have to remember that when we are running out of reserves, they have to send some of our flying someplace else because we've been busy covering other bases flying because they're, the sequences fall apart. So usually here in Phoenix or someplace that we can get to very quickly, they're sending our reserves and deadheading them someplace else to pick up that flying and make sure that, making sure that that flying goes out and stays as close to on time as possible because of um, you know, a sick call or the flight attendants um, timed out. So when we get down to where we have no flight attendants, then they're deadheading them in and flying our sequences. Now we have addressed with our base director, um, regional director, Debbie Carvada, and with Chet White, the uh, senior manager of scheduling, that they not send out our premium flying until after it's been run on. Um, TTS and UBL and run runs at least run at least once on Rota or Rota D. Um, and they've agreed to this. Now um, we saw it last weekend, we immediately sent an email out and the flying came back to Phoenix. So we are keeping up on this. I've got Sakura, you know, Sakura looks at it, I look at it, we text each other all the time. If we're not texting, we're calling. Um, so we, we are trying to keep as much of our flying in here. And as far as the, um, the bid package with the deadheading into Phoenix or deadheading out to Phoenix, we're asking that same question because for years we were told that, um, they were, that planning was forcing flying into Phoenix 
And yet now we're seeing a deadhead into Phoenix to start a sequence or deadhead out of Phoenix to end a sequence. So it does not make sense to us that there was any flying forced into Phoenix when we see this. Josh. Great, thanks uh, Robin for that. The next question is a negotiations related question. Um, is there any news on being able to pick up trips outside of base from the negotiating team? The ability to pick up outside of base would be a huge help to us displaced Phoenix flight attendants. Again, I'm going to ask that flight attendant that submitted that question to please take that question and email it to negotiate at apfa.org. That's negotiate at apfa.org. That's going to be your email to send all your suggestions, your insights, and your observations. Thanks, Deb. Um, I, I also want to mention, you know, last week we did hold a negotiations town hall here at APFA. Um, it is on the APFA website. I've also published the link to that onto uh, the YouTube channel, um, and it, you can watch the full video. It's a great resource that shows you where we currently are in negotiations. The negotiating committee also took the time to explain a little bit about um, Section 6 of the Railway, Railway Ra Labor Act, sorry, um, and, and really goes through that process as well. Um, next question we have. Uh, I've seen on TV that our pilots are going on strike. Is that true and how will that affect us? Um, you want me to take that one? Yes. Pilots are not going on strike. Um, again, so with the town hall that uh, the APFA negotiations committee had uh, last week, they talked about the process of Section 6 negotiations and what happens from beginning of negotiations to getting to the point where we can be released for self-help or strike. The pilots are not there. They are not even that far in the process. Um, they are in, I believe they are in direct negotiations right now under Section 6. So not only did we have this on the town hall meeting, but we're going to be putting out information via video, hopefully this week, and it's literally going to tell you the steps and what happens. So you start off by direct you're in the process, your direct negotiations, the National Mediation Board oversees all this. If you feel like that you're not really making progress, you can ask for the help of a federal mediator. You continue on that process for a while, and it's gonna be up to the mediator and the National Mediation Board if they put the, uh, if they decide there's an impasse, okay? I've sort of given you like a really quick version of it. It is a little bit lengthier than that but the pilots are nowhere near there. They may be doing activities. It's possible they may be doing some sort of an informational picketing. That's highly possible. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, we don't have any more questions submitted. Um, is there any more information that you guys feel pertinent to share with uh, the Phoenix Space Flight Attendants before we end? Um, I would just like to say that um, we really appreciate um, everything that our flight attendants have done over the last year and a half uh, with their flying. I know that it's been difficult. I know that um, there's been days where you just weren't sure that you wanted to come to work because you weren't sure where you were gonna end up. And we do want to tell you how much we appreciate that you've always been shown up because that's what we do here in Phoenix. We take care of each other and we take care of our passengers. It's always been our culture and it will continue to be our culture. So we just, I know Cora and I both appreciate your professionalism and how well you treat our passengers. It's, you know, there's nothing more, you, and you all know that when you get on a um, flight and they say you must have been America West. So, um, you know, it gives you that good feeling, but we want that for everyone. So we want everyone to feel that um, we're here for you. If you have any questions, you can always call us. Um, we do have the office upstairs. Uh, so Cora and I do try to be up here at least 
two to three days each. Um, I try Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays, and Sakura's got days that she will be up here so that we should have them covered. And we're gonna start getting some of our BCRs up here also. And if you have any other questions, um, you know, you've got my number uh, and you have Sakura's and it's on the APFA website, as well as on our Phoenix Base Facebook page. Sakura, do you have anything? No, I'm just happy that when I'm upstairs, some people do actually come and stop by and at least say hello. It's not so lonely in the corner. <laughs> OK, great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, as always, this session was recorded uh, and it will be going out on the Phoenix Space uh, brief hotline um, briefly. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Fly safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody.